the very last okay, yep. there, there we go. This meeting is being recorded. Got it. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. It's a group effort. Okay. Well, as I was saying, you know, the uh, Europeans had not seen Lady Slipper orchids till they came to the United States and they found the Cyperpidium, you know, orchids and um, the Indians called them moccasin flowers and the Europeans thought they were too delicate and beautiful to call them moccasin flowers. So, you know, they coined that name Lady Slippers. And so when we talk about that, we're talking about a Cyperpidium alliance and the subfamily Cyperpidium um, ACE. So we need to understand that um, there's more to it than that. And so mainly what we're going to talk about when we talk about these are um, the Cyperpidiums. And so this is Cyperpidium Kentucky Insus, which some of you may have growing um, you know, in field, wildflower fields and forest at the edge of the forest where it gets to get some life. Um, they seem to like very acidic soil and they grow, the cyperpidiums grow all the way from the Southern United States, all the way up the East Coast and all the way across, oh, uh, this is Kentucky, you know, um, everywhere up to the Great Lakes. We don't find many in the Western part of the United States, but we do find some. And then we have the pathopidellums, and the pathopidellums are from Asia. We do have cyperpidiums in parts of Asia, you know, in the temperate zone areas. So I don't know how many of you read Philip Cribb's book or heard him lecture, but when he was exploring, for example, Vietnam, up in the mountains, he would find the temperate zone cyperpidiums, and then down in the valleys, he would have find the um, path of pedellums, you know, the tropical um, paths. And then we have phragmopidiums, and phragmopidiums are from South America. And as far as the history of finding orchids, that's a pretty recent and particularly some really, really neat ones, recent discovery. And these are the phragmopidium bessii that was discovered in 1981. And then we have uh, Shalimipidium. Um, it's a very rare and unusual orchid. Um, grows on rocks, very, very different, very succulent-like. And then we have Mexipedium. And this is a xeric uh, plant. Again, more like a succulent when you see it growing. Again, very, very rare because of habitat destruction, both for agriculture as well as uh, development. And so the cyperpidiums, we have about 58 species. They're terrestrial, they're temperate, they're herbaceous perennials. They, they freeze down and then they come back up in the springtime and, and bloom pretty quickly in the springtime. Some by springtime up north, I could mean June or July, of course. And so some of you probably seen these before. I know my mother, um, when I started growing orchids, she said that, oh, well, we used to pick, you know, the little orchids that grew wild in the fields near the river where her family had a cabin. And they would go down to that cabin and spend the weekend because it was cooler by the river. And she would pick these like any other wildflower and put them on the, on the dining room table for dinner. And so there's a lot of these around, but because of habitat destruction, because of agriculture, as well as development of cities and homes and, you know, they're, they're disappearing. So it's very, very hard to understand that sometimes. But also, oh, then it's not just lady slipper orchids or cyperpidium, it's a lot of orchids, a lot of plants. Okay, then um, Paphiopidellum, this is what a lot of us might want to try to grow. The cyperpidiums are very, very hard um, we don't encourage it to be collected in nature because they are slowly uh, disappearing. And if you do find a clump, we'd rather see you pollinate the flowers and let the seeds get going than collect them. There are people um, in the United States that are pollinating the cyperpidiums all over and then they're going back and collecting the seeds, number one, for the North American Orchid Conservation uh, Genome Project, but also they are going to collect seeds and try to stop, start them, you know, like we start other orchids like Papapadellum. 
But papaverdellums have been grown from seed for quite a while. They're also grown uh, from division. They're not cloning papaverdellums and cypripediums yet. They just haven't figured out where to get the parenchyma cells or meristemic tissue, you know, in order uh, to clone those. So they're mainly, you're going to get them by seedling or you're going to get them by division. And both ways are absolutely wonderful. They grow very fast. They bloom very easily. Um, and so this is something I suggest. If you can grow phalaenopsis, because these are low light required, you can grow pathopodellums. And I'm also going to recommend uh, Phragmopidiums. But they're tropical. They're mainly found in Asia. They grow in the leaf litter. You never see the roots really going into the soil. They're mainly growing on the composted leaf litter um, on top of the soil. They grow in clumps of very, very short rhizomes. So unlike Phalaenopsis, they don't just keep growing higher and higher and higher on the stem. They send out a short rhizome and then another growth up and then another short rhizome and another clump up, you know, the fan shaped leaves. Very, 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 very pretty. In fact, you know, orchids plants by themselves are not that pretty, but the pathopodellums, both the mottled leaf ones and the green leaf ones, I think they're pretty. I think they make pretty plants. The Phragmopidium is the other um, genus, uh, not genus, but um, part of the Cypripedium Alliance that I would like to, to recommend. These are from Central and South America. They grow in clumps with a little bit longer rhizomes than the Paphopitellum. In fact, sometimes I have one will send out a long rhizome, and, and next thing I know, it's growing off the side of the pot. They like to stay moist, so I'm very, very surprised. Um, that's supposed to say green narrow foliage. I have no idea why the, I didn't pick that up. They like a little bit higher light than your phalaenopsis and your paths, but not that much. So if you have a little bit sunnier um, window or a little bit sunnier area in your greenhouse, or even you can grow these outside for the summer, remembering to bring them in, in for the winter. They don't like full sun. They don't like Cattleya light. They like a little bit more than phalaenopsis. I would say like oncidium like is what they would like. The selenipidium, um, I, I don't think you're going to find this, but it has real pretty, very soft accordion-like foliage. So the plant is, is really nice looking also. They're found in Central and South America. Very difficult to grow and bloom. They like an acidic media. They like to stay moist. Um, the foliage is tall, narrow, and pleated, so it's real pretty. They used to use this as vanilla flavoring. You know, when um, the vanilla crops needed supplementing, they would, they would find this orchid. And that might be a little bit why they're so rare and, and difficult to find nowadays. Um, then uh, Maxipedium, the Xeric orchid. Um, this, like I said, it's a, it's a monotypic you know, genus with one species. <laughs> xeric means it grows very dry. That's what xeric means. And so um, white flowers with this, uh, the pink staminoid, and you don't often see that. Mainly the stamp, mostly, mostly. The staminoids are, are yellow. You know, that has something to do with attracting the pollinator. So they think it's a stamen with, with pollen on it. The foliage is very succulent-like. It grows under dry conditions, and it usually grows on rocks instead of uh, the leaf litter. Um, the lady sever orchids are diandrous, which means they don't have one capsule like most orchids do with the pollinia inside the capsule in the lip. What we have here is the stamens, the pollen holding part of a plant, or on either side right here of this structure called the staminoid. And so the way the insect um, pollinates this plant, it is actually attracted to go into this pouch, into this lip, the labellum. It's actually attracted to go into there, but it can't come out the front of that pouch it has to go out the backside of that pouch. 
And if you look at them, the flowers real, real carefully, you can see that the pouch where it attaches right here, it makes like the, the tissue goes around almost like makes a tunnel. And as the insect climbs out of that tunnel with the help of the hair follicles on that, that they can get their tarsals, their feet in. And when they do that, they hit the, the stamens and eject the pollen. And that's how they get pollinated. When the insect enters another time, the stigma or the stigmatic surface is right under, under here, under the staminoid. And so it takes two times for the insects to, to pollinate this. No wind pollination, no other type of pollination. The other thing you might be looking at is, you know, we always say orchids have um, three petals, one modified to be the lip and then um, two lateral petals. And then we have the big dorsal sepal. Um, and then we have lateral sepals that come usually like this on orchids. But in this case, the case of the lady slipper orchids, they're fused in the back. So they are distinctly two sepals there, but they're fused to look like one sepal. But if you dissect the flower, you'll see that they're two distinct um, two distinct sepals. <laughs> but on most of the Paphopedellum, the Fragmentidiums, um, all of them are going to be that way. And they're hidden behind the lip. So you don't always see those, but it's right, right back up back here. Okay, so we look at the Cyprophidiums here in the United States. I, I didn't bring up the other maps because I thought we were mainly interested in, in where you all are going to find these. And so you know, this is a map and this map, anyone could get to this map. All the maps for all the different plants in the world can be found at this um, B-O-N-A-P. And so um, they haven't updated this one lately, but, you know, the botanists are working very, very much to go back to the areas where the orchids have been found here in North America in order to, number one, make sure they're still there. And the way they're doing that is they're going to herbariums, you know, all over the United States and looking at all the orchid samples and on every herbarium specimen, herbarium specimens are pressed and dried flowers to preserve, you know, the genetics and the DNA and everything. Uh, many, many people use herbariums or sort of like libraries to go study if they're gonna buy some land, they might like to look up what is on that land, what kind of plants are on that land. If they're looking for minerals, they might look at the specimens because certain plants indicate certain minerals are in the soil. And so there's a lot of reasons herbariums have been very, very helpful over the million, you know, hundreds of years that they've been in existence. Um, and so, that's what botanists are doing now. Um, naturalists are doing that. We have a lot of uh, self-educated naturalists that are doing this, a member of that North American conservation group. And so we want to look at that. 64 species, some in Europe, some in Asia. I did, couldn't find the numbers with good references there. Uh, North America has 43. United States has 12 and Alaska has two. Um, it's Ill illegal to dig or pick these orchids on federal land. And I think that that needs to be talked about more and more with people all over because, you know, this is why orchids disappear, not just because of agricultural um, use of the land it's needed for, but also because people, people pick them and they, they don't realize they might be taking the last few that exist. So. Okay, the uh, parfolia, this is probably something you can find in your area. The Kentucky Ensis, the other big giant tall, tall yellow one could be probably down there too. But this is the, what they call the large lady slipper, yellow lady slipper artery. It's per predominantly an upland forest, so higher up in the areas, and it blooms in June and July. This is the Cypripedium. This is a uh, state flower of Minnesota. 
I know New Hampshire, that one of their, their state wildflower is also a lady slipper orchid. So there's lots and lots out there. This is a normal form that you'll find whole fields of, just like our blue bonnets in Texas, we could go out in Minnesota. They're very, very well protected by everyone in Minnesota because it is a state flower. Um, this is the alba form of it. So every now and then you'll find an alba form. They grow on calcareous wetlands, open wooded swamps in the tamarack and black spruce areas, and they bloom uh, early in midsummer. Now we have calcareous soils around here, but um, they're very, very alkaline and they're very, very dry. And so we're not finding anything, any lady slipper orchids in Texas, except the Kentucky Kentuckyensis. And we're only finding that up in the Northeast area of Texas where Oklahoma, you know, Arkansas, they all come together in that three corners area. And it's very, very acidic soil, lots of wetlands there. And so um, I'm not even sure it's showing um, well, this is Regina, of course. I'll, I'll bring up the Kentucky Ensis one. Um, I'm not finding good maps uh, in Louisiana, but I bet you can contact some botanists that are interested in the ones in the Louisiana area, and you can find this. This is a pink lady slipper orchid. This is a state wildflower of New Hampshire and the provincial flower of Prince Edward's Island in Canada. And so anytime I see something that, you know, it grows wild in New Hampshire, grows wild up in Prince Edward's Island in Canada, I'm already going to say to myself, well, I can't grow that, you know, because um, of the different weather that they have out there. The peach pouch um, has a sort of a little slit in it right here. And that accommodates uh, the insects getting in there, of course, and getting to the the pollen and getting it pollinated. They have these brown, you know, lateral petals. And then if you look real closely, you can sort of see part of the, well, the dorsal petal here, but the um, lateral sepals back there. So, I mean, this is the dorsal sepal. It grows in the shade, pine, hardwood, forest flowers in April and July. Okay, and here is the, um, map that they put on. Any, anytime you see this yellow, and sometimes you'll even see orange, if there's an orange dot there, that county had been identified of having the orchids at one time, but they've never found them uh, again. They found one herbarium specimen, went to look and identify it. There's a herbarium specimen, a botanist always put on there where they found those, the county, I mean the state and the county. And where was it in wetlands, dry lands? And so you can see it's it, it's actually a really really pretty plant. Again, a herbaceous perennial. It blooms. Hopefully, gets pollinated. Hopefully, disperses seeds, and then comes back the next spring from the from the roots. This is Kentucky Kentuckyensis. Like I said, it's the only one found here in Texas. But if you look at the map. You know, there's some places where it at one time was identified in Alabama, identified in Kentucky, and that grows in um, Virginia. A little bit, one in Georgia, one siding in Georgia. And so really, really pretty plant. Not as vigorous and numerous. Um, I've been growing orchids since 1973. And a couple of field trips up there to see the Kentucky Ensis when they're bloom proved just absolutely wonderful. Adam Black is going back through Texas with all the data that he's collected to refine all these orchids. And one of his goals is to pollinate all the lady slipper orchids, particularly the Kentucky Ensis, which seems to be uh, disappearing. You know, developers will go into boggy areas where these grow and drain the bogs and fill them in and, you know, build homes. So, you know, habitat destruction. So there's a big, big push to reintroduce these. And so at the same time, he pollinates these orchids when he finds them 
all the orchids, not, not just the Kentuckiensis in Texas. But then he goes back when the seeds should be ripe and he lays 90% of the seed pods on the orchids that he pollinated, but he collects one or two seed pods, depending on the number of seed pods that formed. And then he brings them back and gives them to a few people in the United States that are trying to grow them uh, from seed. So hopefully we'll see these someday put back into nature. You know, I know that the Atlanta Botanic Gardens for years and years have been tissue culturing Venus flytraps to reintroduce them back into um, nature because the territory where they grow, they grow in North Carolina and South Carolina near the coast, not in estuary or but bogs a little bit further in. But those areas are being filled in and pretty much destroyed to build resorts and golf courses and things like that. So the Venus flytrap may someday, even though it's always been in the United States, maybe someday it won't be there in its original habitat. But the Atlanta Botanic Garden is tissue culturing those and reintroducing those on protected land. You know, national forests, um, national parks, um, conservancy land, um, arboretums, botanic gardens, places like that that have the right habitat for them. So no, someday you'll be able to go to a botanic garden and see those. So let's go back to Papapodellums because I think that this is one we all might be very, very, very interested in growing. Um, they're tropical, they're from Asia, they need low to medium light. The flowers last one to three months. And I, I, I tell you, some of the paths in, in my greenhouse, they just, you know, they all plants only grow on new growth. But sometimes the plant, the, the lady slipper orchids, the Paphopidellum and the Phragmopidiums, they put on four or five growths a year, you know, so they're going to bloom four or five times. So it's really, really wonderful. Wonderful plant to get into. Um, they like um, 60 to 90 degrees, if, if you can do that. I know in, in my greenhouse this summer, we went about four weeks without any rainfall, very hot and dry outdoors. It was very, very hard to get that temperature down. But all my um, Paphopidellums and Phragmopidiums grow down by uh, my cool cell pads, you know, my wet wall. And so it stays cooler there than any place else in the greenhouse. Require uh, about two weeks of colder, colder temperature in the fall. And I, my husband has um, hybridized, you know, Phalaenopsis since 1973. And so we always have done that for the late, uh, for the Phalaenopsis, you know, lowered the temperature down to, you know, 50, 55 degrees in order to get that that colder two weeks that they need. And so that's been easy. The green foliage likes it a little bit cooler and the mottled foliage likes a little bit lower light, a little bit warmer. Because I notice if um, I put the model foliage where it gets a little bit more light, what happens that modeling sorta, it's not as vibrant. But if I have it in very, very low light, it's, it's, it's real pretty. You can see it real well. Um, the colors are, oh gosh, anywhere from white to green to dark, magenta, the Vinny color, they're called Vinny color paths, just absolutely wonderful. Again, they're propagated by division and seed. And so this is Spicerianum. This is one of the species. And the only reason I'm showing these is because a lot of times when you look at a hybrid, you know, so much of this carries on for the second, sometimes third, and sometimes even fourth generation. You know, this green uh, and this, all oh, this white, white dorsal petal with that stripe, very, very distinctive, even, even of its hybrids. So the path of Adelum, like I said, are mainly Asians. You know, if you look at this habitat map, you can see all the different areas where these grow and like I said, in some areas where the mountains are, you are going to see cypripediums high in the mountains where temperate plants grow and everything, the paphopidellums are going to be growing in the tropical areas. Again, they grow on 
and leaf litter with a limestone subsoil, moist areas, shade to part shade. And so, oh wait, I wanted to point out one thing. Um, okay, the reason I've got so much just white space, or I didn't make the map, someone else did, but there's a little area right here where Jurii, the little species called Papavidellum Jurii does. And then if you look down here on the peninsula, you can see um, some there too. And so um, please, if you're, if you're gonna grow these, buy them from very reliable sources, buy healthy, healthy plants, and, and you're gonna do great. So this is a model foliage, isn't that pretty? Very, very, very pretty. And like I said, I noticed some of mine, you know, if I give them a little bit too nice, that modeledness is not as distinctive. You know, it, it looks more all green, but you can still see it. And this is the green foliage and you can see, you know, they grow this itty bitty rhizome and then shoot up another one and shoot up another one, shoot up another one. So, you know, usually you get a pot full very, very, very quickly. And so this again is another species and see this beautiful striping on the dorsal petal, you know, this green pouch with the venation showing. I don't know how many of you've seen Claire de Lume, the hybrid Claire de Lume. Uh, oh my, my goodness, it picks up all of this from the species. See how the tip out here is yellow. I'm gonna show you another one where it's, it's purple. Um, not, not the venosa, but uh, venosa, but another one. Okay, light. Everyone's always asking me light, and I always say medium to uh, low to medium shade. In other words, a south or southeast wind is best. Um, not a south wind. You know, in the winter, winter the um, sun goes about 15 degrees more south in the winter, and then 15 degrees higher in the summer. And so you have to sort of watch that south window and it might need to be away from the south window a little bit. The reason a south window is so good is because you get light for so long a period of time as the sun goes from east to west. Whereas if you put it in an east window, you're just gonna get that morning light. If you put it in a west window, you're gonna get that hot west sun. And I don't, I, I don't know about Baton Rouge, but boy, I shut my shades my west window shades in the afternoon. It makes it so hot to leave those open. Um, grows in flowers easily under lights. I have a lot of people ask about that and that's why I'm telling you that. And so this is a wonderful path collection that a lady has in Portland. She's moving here to Texas. And so she uh, had her husband bring all the orchids and she's running bench space in my greenhouse while they move and build a house and build a greenhouse. But it grows great under lights. Uh, that's the, the, the lights that, that you're seeing here could be just um, incandescent grow lights could be, but in this case, they're fluorescent lights. Many different types of fluorescent grow lights. Um, some of them have more of a blue and red spectrum. And so you need to look into what you want and in the fixtures that will hold those, those other type of fluorescent lights. This is a high intensity discharge light. And these can be bought either through catalogs or orchid supply houses. But if you um, have a hydroponic grower supply place in your area, both the high intensity discharge lights, all the different fluorescent grow lights, the high pressure sodium lights and the LED lights, these would all be available with the fixtures from, from those. So I know the, there's two here in the Fort Worth area. One of them has put all those lights um, up, you know, in their thing. And so you can actually say, well, will you turn on these so I can see what the plants look like under them because they have plants there. And they'll do that, they'll turn on each type. So the advantage of the, like the high intensity discharge light is they put out white light and your plants look the normal color under those. If you use high pressure sodium lights, it gives everything a yellow tinge. 
And so you're not seeing the true colors on the foliage or the flowers. If you use LED lights, which mainly is the blue and red spectrum and not the white spectrum, then your plants look black under there. And so I'm always telling hydroponic growers as well as orchid growers that want to use those, that's great to use LED lights, the grow light, LED grow lights, but you might want to put some white lights in there and have two different switches in order to show your collection off because this is um, a laundry room where, you know, all the LED lights are on. You can't tell what those plants look like at all or the flowers, but if we could turn off those LED lights and turn white light on, uh, then you can see them. And it's very important to have the right amount of light and everything, but it's also important for you to be able to see your plants because you are the plant detective for insects and disease issues and water issues. So we need to understand that. So you can see a lot of the shelving like this uh, with the LED lights and white fluorescent lights under them. And so you can see some of these have been turned on so you could see inspect the plants for you know insects and disease. Vertical farming like this is becoming very popular for your leafy greens and leafy herbs. And so I know there's a, there was a big groundbreaking um, two weeks ago in Cleburne, Texas, just about 30 minutes south of Fort Worth. And they're gonna, they're gonna do a vertical farm uh, just for that, just for leafy greens. And so that's gonna be real interesting to see how that going. They, they built a small one to do, make all their mistakes on and they did a real good job. There are a lot of people interested in buying their produce. And so they're going to build a big one now. Vertical farming, where you farm shelf after shelf after shelf after shelf, rotating the shelves to harvest. And so the temperature range, um, you know, you need to remember, you need to cool them off. And, you know, 10 or 20 degrees difference between day and night temperature, sometimes that can be achieved, sometimes it can't. Um, but you want to try, you know, particularly in the spring and summer, you can, you, in winter, you can do that. The cooler varieties take temperatures down to 40 degrees, lower humidity during the cool temperature. And so this is, I don't know how many of you have these in your grow area, where, whether it's indoors, outside, or in a greenhouse. But this is a real nice, it tells you how hot it got that day and how low the temperature got that evening. And so if you're keeping a journal, you know, about the humidity, the airflow, the heat, the cooling, and the temperature, real nice to have these. They have, a, uh, this is very affordable, not electric, not um, hooked to your Wi-Fi, but there are those now too. So in fact, some of them, you can set a weather station up in your greenhouse or in your backyard, everything will go to your phone. And that's nice to have. As far as cooling, you know, uh, old fashioned evaporative coolers were great. This is the type of thing where this would be inside your greenhouse and water would circulate on the three walls that are outside your greenhouse. It circulates and drip down what are called aspen pads. And the fan, there's a fan, a, a squirrel cage type fan in there that will push that air into your greenhouse. And this where the cool air comes out is mainly useful in dry, hot areas and real, real humid areas. It's not that efficient, mainly air circulation with fans is the best thing there. And then we have a wet wall and a, an exhaust system. And so here's my, here's a wet wall where I, I have a big tub and I recirculate the water over and over. A lot of evaporates, of course, but that's what I do. Here's the outside of it where I have an, a motor that will lift that windows up high or you know shut it down real low or shut it all the way. And then I have the exhaust fans at the other end of the greenhouse. I put these on the north side of my greenhouse. I put this on the west uh, south side. And in my area where it's hot and dry, this works very, very, both of these. These all work very, very, very well to cool them. 
circulation fans, I have them hanging from my ceiling. I have them um, on the benches where they'll blow over the tops of the orchid plants, not on the orchid plants necessarily because I don't have a lot of fungus and bacteria in my greenhouse. If I did, I'd have those fans um, blow, blowing directly on the, on the foliage. But you need a lot of air circulation. I know that some of the old timers used to say, if your hair is not blowing in the wind, you don't have enough air circulation. Well, I'm not so sure I agree with that, except when it's 110 degrees outside, I want as much of that fan as possible. So um, I also have one right there in my potting, my potting area in the greenhouse. And then shade, we have to think about shade as part of the cooling. And we have to think of shade as part of the growing the plant. And so if we have shade loving plants, we have medium like plants like oncidiums and some of our dendrobiums, and then we have high, you know, wanting plants like my bandas, my cattleyas, uh, my ascocindas, you know, just, I can't name all of the highlight plants that I have in my greenhouse, but I mainly have paths and phalaenopsis. So I would say, Two thirds of my greenhouse needs good shade and, and one third doesn't need good shade. And so we have choices here where we can use a paint. You can buy green or white, what is called shade compound paint. And it's like whitewash and you mix it up as thick as you want the shade or as thin as you want the shade. And so it comes off very easy if you want more light you can just take a wet broom, really, I'm serious, a wet broom, wet it real good and, and rub some of that off to get more light like during the winter. And so the other option is what is called shade cloth. And the shade cloth comes in black and green, aluminum looking cloth. I mean, really, really in white, white, all kinds of different color shade cloth. Um, and then you can see also one of the things that I always recommend, I keep um, ferns growing underneath my benches. And I do this for two reasons. One of the reasons I do it is because I think all the creepy crawly slugs and snails are going to stay down there because they got all that food to eat. They're not going to crawl up my benches and, and, and do it. This lady wanted a really, really clean greenhouse. So she got that very, very expensive, very thick and heavy landscape fabric. You've probably seen it at garden centers where they have an outdoor growing area and a control weeds. They put this heavy, heavy, it's not like what you would buy at Home Depot or Lowe's. Very, very heavy. And so she put this down because she wanted a real clean greenhouse. She's mainly a geranium grower. She grew all kinds of of geraniums, made geranium topiaries, but see what she has, her cinder blocks are holding up her benches. And you see that yellow tape around each of the cinder blocks? That's sticky tape, you know, because one of the things that you have to do is monitor your greenhouse for insects. And so she has that around those cinder blocks. So if insects start trying to grow up to the benches, she can identify those very quickly. You can get sticky pads, both yellow and green, to put around your greenhouse. Just hold them on a card holder type thing to monitor for insects. But the best way to do it is, you know, you, you inspect your plant and you take copious notes about it. I call it mapping a greenhouse. And so I know, you know, when the mowers come, you know, and I have insect netting now um, that comes, the frame comes way out here, way to the top of this wet wall. And that insect netting is keeping all those insects that are gonna try to fly away or jump away or hop away from the mowers from coming through that wet wall. And so I have had calls from all over about um, all of a sudden, my, 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 my greenhouse is full of insects. What's the deal? Well, you know, they mowed and the insects got into the greenhouse because of that. So it's just one more thing that we all have to do if we have a greenhouse in order to, to do that. As far as heating, 
Um, you want to make sure that I, I, I like these Modine heaters that are Dayton heaters that you can hang from the ceiling. And again, um, I have a 30 by 100 foot greenhouse. So I have a, a, a poly tube that goes down and the heater actually blows the heat into plenum and then it gets in that tube and is distributed the whole 100 foot lengths of the greenhouse. And the tube has holes on the side to let the warm air out. You know, and so it works real well with mine. Of course, a smaller greenhouse, you wouldn't need something like that. But if you can not use bench space to put your heater, you're, you're doing real good. Now, this is a southern burner. Um, when I first started growing orchids, I, I bought three of these, and I'm so glad I did. They don't need electricity. They have a built-in uh, thermostat in the thermocoupler, um, and they use a natural gas or propane. But unfortunately, Southern Birders has gone out of business. Now there's a rumor that someone is buying them and, and that's gonna, maybe they're gonna come back in. But the main thing is they didn't need electricity. Um, and then this is, this is a big gigantic boilers and they heat up hot water, they heat up the water. And then the water is taken into the greenhouse and pipes underneath the benches, underneath the benches, and it circulates, it circulates. And so that, that's a really good way. Propagators, plant propagators love these. They love these because they like that bottom heat, all their seedlings. As far as humidity, if you have a small orchid collection, you know, I, I love baskets and a lot of times I'll find a plastic crate that I can put. I'll put aquarium gravel in there. And I never want my orchids sitting in water because the potting material lets the water wick up through the potting material. In fact, most of the orchids that people bring me, you know, what's wrong with my orchid type thing, they've overwatered it, not because they poured water in it, in the pot, but because I've left it sitting in water and it wicks up and creates that overwatering situation. And they're all wilted. And the owner that brings me the, the poor wilted plant said, well, it was wilted, so I figured it needed more water and more water. <laughs> well, we all know that that's not, not, that's not quite right with orchids. And so here's with a box, of, uh, a box full of Doritis, now called Phalaenopsis. These are summer blooming Phalaenopsis and they bloom with straight spikes up. And so I have, <clears throat> I have quite a variety of these and my husband uh, used this little gym quite well. He used it several times um, to get that, that neon purple color for some of his hybrids. Um, this is another way, this is called egg crating. It's, uh, it's found in the lighting department of most um, box stores and um, lighting stores where they put that over fluorescent light to diffuse it. And boy, that is strong material and easy to clean if it gets algae on it. So you can either have it over a box like this, or you can cut it to fit down into the box and not have gravel there. Gravel gets algae in it just almost immediately. And sand too, and that's, I, I don't like those materials as much as I used to because of that. And then this is my bench before the ferns took over. <laughs> you can see them starting to take, a, oh, I forgot the second reason. I put the ferns there. Um, the other is what is called transpiration. All plants use water, you know, that comes up through their roots and it goes into their stem and their foliage. And the water is used in almost all their metabolic activities. Well, in order to increase the humidity, um, one of the ways if you grow plants underneath your benches or companion plants in your, in your house where you're growing your orchids or outside where you're growing orchids, the companion plants transpire this water because they have water left over from all, including photosynthesis, all their metabolic activity. So the underside of all leaves have what we call uh, plants leaves, have stomata, little openings that allow respiration, the taking in of carbon dioxide and the releasing of oxygen, but at the same time, they release water. 
And transpiration increases the hotter and drier it is. And the ferns are constantly, constantly letting that water out. I have misters under the benches too, you know, and I, I run those if it drops much below 50 50% humidity to get that humidity up back up real fast. As far as your potting mix, I know everyone has their favorite potting mix. And when you find your favorite potting mix, you need to put everything in that potting mix because then your water and fertilizer, it doesn't become uniform by any means because you're fertilizing different things, different times of the year sometimes. But anyway, the potting mix. The paths like the paths and Phragmopedium, I use three parts bark. Now parts by part, I could put a gallon there, I could put a quart there, I could put a four inch pot there. You only wanna mix up the amount and wet down the amount you're gonna use that day. You don't want it to sit in water because the, decom the decomposition of your bark starts pretty fast if it stays wet for very long. So I use um, three parts medium bark, two parts fine bark, a half a part sponge rock, the big giant, Perlite. I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. I use half a part of um, the charcoal. I use number three and number four. The smaller number, of course, is the larger, and the uh, number four is the smaller. So I use the smaller um, in that. I use the larger for my like uh, for my phalanx. Phalanx. Enough. Quarter um, cup of dolomite lime per ten gallons of mix. That's a huge amount, you know. But the the scientist that studied this, how much dolomite I'm to put in it, he came up with this formula. So if we're talking about mixing a gallon, we're probably talking about a teaspoon of, of dolomite I. But I have a composting tumbler. I have two of them. One of them, I mix all my lady slipper orchid mix in. And the other one I use for all the other stuff, you know, phalaenopsis, catlias, bandits, everything else. Um, because of the dolomite line. I don't want dolomite line in any of the other things. The other thing my husband likes to do is he likes to go down to the feed store and get the crushed oyster, oyster shells. And so he loves to put that in the mix. Now I find when I repot the paths or the fragmentpediums, um, some of the some of that has shifted through down towards the, it hadn't stayed in the conglomerate, but he loves to do that. He loves to put that in. Wet your bark overnight when you're getting ready to repot, but only wet the amount you're going to use that day. Um, they need repotting every one to two years, depending on how you know florifice and not florifice, but how fast they grow. You know, some of them outgrow the pots. You turn your back around and you turn back the other way. And oh my gosh, I need to repot that already. They're very fast growers, some of them. Never over pot. Don't put them in too large of a pot. Just be prepared to, you know, repot them in, in two, to, two to. Okay, this is a sponge rock. I put it on, I put the tape there so that you can get an idea. Um, and so this is number three on perlite. And again, it's called sponge rock, these big pieces. You can get perlite any size you want, but most of it is very, very fine, a lot of dust in it, you know? So it, the bigger, the better as far as. Perlite is a, a sort of a, a sand that has been put under pressure and popped like popcorn. And it crumbles very, very easily. So the larger the perlite, the better for you. And then this is garden lime. Now, usually this is gonna be bought in big, big, huge bags for all of us that have to lime our soils, you know, in order to grow whatever crop we're, we're growing in our fields. But you can get little hobby bags like this and a bag like that will last me three years, three years. Okay, repotting, you know, um, you know, you can buy mixes you know, already mixed up for you. I happen to have these two tumblers. This, this lower to the ground one is where I do my path mix. And this one over here is where I do the everything else mix. And remember that if you're going to put lime in there, it dissolves very easy in the water. It sticks very easily to the bark. 
um, you want to moisten only the amount you're going to use that day. You don't want that to precipitate out, which which I have seen it do. Um, I know that I one of the companion plants I like to grow is maidenhairs, ferns, and they like the lime soil. And so I have that powdery lime that I can sprinkle on my maidenhair ferns. I can sprinkle it on my paths if they're, if they're not doing my as far as containers go, I mean, I love the solided orchid pots or the solided ceramic orchid pots, all kinds of fun, fun pots out there for orchid growers. But I, I think two things. Number one, it doesn't matter what you pot it in, except, you know, you want a little bit limey. And it doesn't matter what the mix is, except you want it limey. It doesn't matter what you pot it in, plastic or clay but it matters how you do the watering. And so a plastic pot's gonna stay wet a little bit longer than a clay pot. And so we need, need to know that right away. So we have to tailor our water needs to the orchid, not the potting material and not the uh, container. And so once we start doing this, it's very, very easy to recognize when it. When, when it needs uh, water. Um, I like the clear plastic pots because a lot of times I have student workers in the greenhouse and I'll say go water bench seven or bench eight, you know, where the paths are and the frags are. And um, I have this one student's a little heavy on the watering. And so I don't ask him to do it much, but you know, every now and then I'm, tied up somewhere and need them to do it. But you can, you can see the roots, you can see the moisture level in the container. Those clear pots are really good for another reason, for that reason. The other thing is I want you to see how, how different the roots are. Remember, a lot of these are considered terrestrial, you know, grow in the ground. They really don't grow in the soil, they grow in the compost on top of the soil, the leaf litter. And so if you look real, real carefully before they desiccate, you know, when they're exposed to air, you can actually see hair roots on here. It's the, the villamen on these is not like the villamen on your, your phalaenopsis or your mandas. You know, it's very, very good. You want to repot, of course, when it outgrows the container, um, when the potting material has turned to compost and holds too much water. But mainly what you want to see are these new, new roots, new roots. If you see new roots, it's time to repot. If, if they need repot, if they need repotting. So, so think about that. They need to stay evenly moist, not soaking wet. Do not water the, let the plants sit in water and they need low salinity in the water. So if I dug a well here on my property and pump that up, to use in my greenhouse, it would be way, way too salty because our aquifer is salty here. And so what I have to do then is I collect rainwater. And we got two inches of rain this week. I'm so excited. My cisterns are full, you know. So, um, you know, think about the water quality. Your city might have perfect water for watering your orchids, but just pay attention to the pH they like it below seven, you know, 6.3 to 6.8. Um, they don't like it above seven. And so rainwater is, uh, has a lot of nitrogen in it. And that's about it. No salts, no salt. There's no salts up there in the clouds. And so when it comes down and you can catch that off the roof of your greenhouse or your house or your garage or your potting shed, um, you're way ahead of everyone for that. And so this is um, fertilizing because I want to think about fertilizing. So I use what is called a siphonex where I mix up a concentrate. I mix up a con one gallon concentrate or two gallons depending on how many orchids I have that I'm gonna fertilize. And I do that and this is my rainwater collection system where you know, I have guttering along the whole 100 foot side of both sides of the greenhouse. 2,500 gallon cisterns on either side. The water goes straight into the main line in the greenhouse. This is what's called a first flush diverter, where the first flush off the guttering 
will go down here. So any leaves or debris collects in this elbow right here. I have a cap right there where I can unscrew the cap and, and clean that out every now and then. And then the, and this fills up with rainwater. Hopefully all the leaves are gonna stay down here. And then it goes in into my cistern. So real, real easy to, to set up a, a collection. Most of us want to use a high nitrogen fertilizer, particularly if we're using a bark-based media. Um, I fertilize every two weeks, but I'll fertilize and then I'll water to leach out all the salts and then I'll fertilize and then leach. So I fertilize and water. I fertilize and then use no fertilizer water and then fertilize and then use no fertilizer water. Why the plants are actively growing. And so we have choices of all kinds of wonderful water-soluble fertilizer. And some of those water-soluble fertilizers, like this is actually labeled orchid food and has a picture of an orchid on it. We can mix up a little bit at a time, depending on how much, much we have. But this is what I've used for years and years and years. This is called a Siphonex, and you can buy it at good garden centers or you can order it from any of your um, online supply places or Amazon. This is what's called a capillary tube. And as you turn the water on, you know, this will suck up the concentrated fertilizer from your bucket and dilute it 15 times, 15 times. So the concentrate's pretty, pretty strong. So you only wanna mix up as much as you're gonna apply because nitrogen is a volatile chemical and you'll lose that nitrogen that's in that in that concentrate if you're not careful. And so here it is hooked to another garden hose and you know here's my bucket and I like the, the colored fertilizer. Here's when you buy it. Um, you know um, if I do have because I I for my large large greenhouse I mix it up in a big garbage can with a snap on lid. And so I mix up 25 pounds at a time. But that first number on your fertilizer bag, that's gonna be your nitrogen. And so I like the Peters mix, you know, with MagAmp in it. It's a 15515. Um, um, I like MagAmp, I either add it or, or buy the Peters with it already in there. So as far as the Papapodellums, all these beautiful, beautiful species you can get, um, these are wonderful, easy, easy to grow. They're a little bit more expensive than your average phalaenopsis because phalaenopsis are tissue cultured and the Chinese um, flood the market with them. Very, very affordable. But branch out, branch out, try some of these. This is Malapanense from China. Uh, this is Arminiopcum. Um, this is Delanotii, again from China, Macranthrum. And then we have these big, 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 what we call standard phalaenop, I mean, papapodellum, big, 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 big flowers. You know, the size a little bit bigger than the palm of your hand, very waxy, last a very, very long time. These are very, very popular and many, many different colors. But all those species I was showing you are the beginnings of all of these hybrids. And so a lot of times you can look at a hybrid like this and sort of tell what species are, are in the background. And so it's really, really fun. The vinny colored orchids, these dark, dark, dark. I mean, I have one even darker than this. Wonderful, wonderful new hybridization line. As far as the, you know, problems goes, a lot of times we smush all our plants together and, you know, we might hit hit, um, well, you can't see me pointing, so I'll, I'll use this. We'll hit the tips, and anytime the plant is injured, you know, you have an opportunity that, um, let me get back to that, that a bacteria or fungus will come in. If it's a fungus, it's dry looking, and it grows, and so you'll see waves where it's growing. Where this yellow tissue is, that's the mycelium of the fungus, you know, growing and parasitizing, uh, the fresh tissue. And so the, the key here is to, if we're going to try to save as much of this leaf as possible, not to cut right here, but to cut down here where you know no mycelium is growing. I'd remove this whole entire leaf because it's almost to the, the crown of the plant. 
Mealybugs is the other issue. Mealybugs like to hide from the light and rain and our irrigation water. So they're always going to be on the lower side of the leaf. And when you're looking down on your phalaenopsis, you're not going to see them on the foliage. They're going to be under the leaf. And, but you'll see that it's a little yellow, sometimes mottled yealow where the, the, the mealybugs are spread out. They love the the, to fly with the wind, um, they get on the tips and the, and the major uh, vein structure there. Scale is the other one. We have hard scale and soft scale. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, both with mealybugs and with scale, a lot of times, I mean, I just use soap and alcohol, and the soak up, the soap smothers them, and the alcohol sort of deteriorates the shell, the protective coating that the mealybugs and scale uses, but it doesn't knock it off. And so you might have a, a scale like this on your leaf. Now this is obviously very infested because you can see the modeling and discoloration of the sucking of the insect. And so sometimes you have to go um, with a high pressure nozzle on your garden hose and, and knock these off. Sometimes I'll even take a wet soapy cloth and, and just literally go like this to the leaf because that cleans off the top side and the bottom side at the same time. Um, fungus, of course, like I said, you're gonna see this, the mycelium growth, it's dry and brown, musty smelling. Bacteria is black and yucky and smelling. And bacteria, if you see bacteria and fungus act fast, do something right away. Um, you can use hydrogen peroxide uh, and cinnamon. Cinnamon is not a fungicide or a bactericide, it's a desiccant. So sometimes you can pour it in the crown of your phalaenopsis or your paths and dry out the fungus faster than it can parasitize the tissue. Um, but hydrogen peroxide works right too. So I keep a case over here. Uh, thank goodness I bought two cases before the coronavirus quarantine started because boy, you couldn't find peroxide anywhere for quite a while and, and alcohol. And so I use that a, a quite a bit. Bacteria is stinky, black, and grows very, very, very fast. Okay, so you can see, you know, it's probably got this bacteria probably gets started at the tip of one of these leaves that got injured. And it's taken that plant out very, very fast. New trend in um, hybrids for the orchids are what we call multiflora. There's two types of multiflora. One, where they all open pretty much at the same time. Um, my, we're holding this yardstick up so that you can see these lateral petals. You see how this is Sandriana and they got it, got an award. And so they named it Ho Nine Yards. <laughs> I love that. But if you're gonna get one of these that you know is gonna send out and grow and boy, they grow by the inch daily and they get longer and longer. You have to make sure that those petals, those lateral petals, don't hit your bench. And so sometimes I put those on a pedestal, you know, to make sure that, you know, they're not going to hit the bench before I get back the next day. Or let them hang over the side of your benches. Another way, as long as you know someone's not going to run into them. Philippines, easy to grow, wonderful, beautiful plant, too, when it's not in bloom. Uh, Rochuliana, a uh, very vigorous, very tough plant. The foliage can, oh man, that's a, I mean, you talk about jagantias and phalaenopsis. This is a jagantia of the pan. And a lot of hybrids have been made with the Rochuliana. And I love the ones where they all open at the same time. The others are called successive bloomers. You know, one bloom will bloom on the stem and then the stem will grow some more, and then another one will bloom, and another one will bloom, and another one will bloom. Um, and so we have those types. This is a Rochiliana hybrid, um, path um, Prince um, Edward of York. Uh, outstanding, beautiful, easy to grow. Now, I told you I was going to talk about Phragmopidium. This bestiae 
This orange Phragmopedium was never known until 1982. 1982. And so they're still discovering plants out there. So much fun to think about, you know, and um, it likes to stay very, very wet. Some people even let it sit in a tray of very clean water. No, no salt, no salt. Um, now, the other Phragmopediums that were discovered in South America, you know, the Schlemii was discovered in the 1800s when the Europeans went, you know, in this was discovered, this Kravakii was discovered in 2001. And we're talking about an orchid that is big as my hand, you know, from the lateral petals, those big, big round lateral petals. Amazing, amazing. Um, the, the cardatum, this is the one that almost all your hybrids are made out of. This is in the background of most of your hybrids that'll have those lateral petals that will grow you know grow longer and longer and longer and longer um cardatum this is another color form of it and this is what see i and look look at its look at its petals down here it's lateral petals and so these are just wonderful wonderful plants to look at and and i know probably none of us want some of the this is a pouchless it doesn't have a pouch <laughs> um some of us might not want to even think of growing some of the little tiny um, abbreviated, maybe I should say um, species, but I just want you to know this is what makes all your hybrids and they're very exotic, very neat to have. But Bessie Eye is one of the favorites when it was discovered because of that shocking, shocking orange color. Um, you'll find a lot of hybrids of different color Bessie eyes, different forms of Bessie eyes out there for sale. Um, there's a pink form, this orange form, and a yellow form. I, I've got to tell the story because it's so funny that this lady bought a Bessie eye and it bloomed and it bloomed yellow. And she took it back to the grower and said, well, this isn't a Bessie eye, it's yellow. I want an orange or red one. You know, and he was like looking at that Bessie eye like it was his last meal. And he said, take anything, anything. I'll take the yellow one. You know, he was so excited to see a yellow Bessie eye. That's a great story and just tells you, you know, how orchid growers are always looking for not the same, but the more unusual. And will that breed through? Will that yellow breed through? Well, yes, it will that we've discovered. This is my greenhouse and you can see I have a lot of um, vandas hanging way, way up high at the north end of the greenhouse where the exhaust fans are so that they can um, get the higher light, more heat, not near the wet wall. You can see I have fans um, hanging from the ceiling to circulate air, but I also have fans on the benches. Like I said, my husband hybrid has hybridized many, many phalaenopsis for for many, many years. Uh, this is my greenhouse and my, my garden. If y'all are ever in Fort Worth, please give me a call and let me invite. We grow the Amazon water lily too. This is my husband, Barry, and with our greenhouse in the background. And this is one of our Rochiliana hybrids. Love these things, love these things. As far as your sources go, I can't uh, recommend Teresa Hill um, Hillview or Hills View orchids for your complex hybrids, some, some species. If you're interested in the Bessiae or the Carbacchia, these newer, well, you know, 1982 and 2001 um, species, I, I shouldn't have capitalized these. These should be lowercase, they're species. Multiflora, Jason Fisher of Orchids Limited, um, the Path Paradise with David, Complex hybrids, multi-floors, and Crail Smith, don't forget, in Apaca, Florida, Crail Smith, Frank Smith. He has lots and lots of beautiful award-winning uh, paths. Uh, now, I, I'm going to remind you again that there, you'd be buy, dividing, they'd be, you'd be buying divisions or seedlings, not, not clones yet. They haven't figured out how to clone them yet. And of course, the resource, of course, for you all, I, you know, talk in this area so much, but um, the American Orchid Society, um, 
has a list of orchid vendors and tells where they are um, and what type of orchids they grow. That's a super, super good resource. This is my uh, cell phone number, my mobile number, and this is my email address. I'd be glad for you all to visit when you're in the area. Please let me know in advance and then um, email me any pictures or questions that, that you might have about problems with your orchids. So, so do we have questions? Do we have, um, did you all put them on the chat or did you? Let's see if we've got any in the chat. First, let me just say thank you. That was a great presentation. I, I loved it. I learned a whole lot. You covered a, there's like I, I've the, the comment about the soaker for the um, for the uh, greenhouse and that I've always wondered what the device was called. So anyway, a lot, but, but lots of great orchid specific information and good general information. So thank you for that presentation. Uh, well, thank let you me for inviting see. me to, to give the talk. Thank you. Let me see if there's anything in the chat. Um, uh, yeah, so Larry Hennessy asks, are there any paths or frags that don't like the lime? Not that I know of, but anytime you buy one from a, a grower, ask that question. Ask that question. We're talking about like one teaspoon in a gallon of your potting material. We're talking about a very, very, very small amount. But most of them grow in leaf litter over limestone. And that's and why you're it, adding Is lime. it changing the pH or is it not like much, offering but calcium? But enough. Or? It changes the pH a little bit, not much. Okay. And so when you're when you're looking at that, you look at the pH of the water going into the pot, and then you catch the water coming out of the pot and test the pH of that. If you want to know how much that lime is making a difference in the the orchid media, you see what I'm saying? Yes. Catch the pH of the water going into the pot and the pH of the water coming out of the pot, draining out of the pot. Well, does anybody else have a question? My, on my lady yeah, slipper, orchids, I have a question. I put a tablespoon every year on that, that if I'm not going to repot them. Yes, okay. what is your question? I have a question. Uh, I was fascinated about what you said about the growing ferns under the benches. benches. Yes. Any particular kind of fern? I love ferns and I love orchids. That appeals to me. Well, no, I, you know, all plants transpire water. You know, um, I know right. um, some people put their airplane plants to grow under the benches because oh, okay. slugs and snails like will too. not, they'll stay and eat that. They won't get up on your benches. I know some people put the, the little purple um, transcendent under their benches, you know, so uh -huh. Joseph boat one, you know, that blooms with the little flower. Yeah. Um, you know, I grow those out in my garden. I don't grow those in the green. Well, I guess one fell off the propagation bench and is in one green house, but um, it, I don't think it matters which plants you grow. I, I those ferns get real, real thick. And so every now and then, um, a lady from McKinney, Texas, and her son came over the other day, and I asked them if they like ferns, and I got a big, giant, black yeah. garbage bag and just started pulling them up, and I filled that garbage bag up for them. And yeah. I said, well, here you go, there you go, you know, to thin them out, to thin them out. And I know yeah. one of my students oh, thank you, thank was fighting. We hadn't cut back the ferns under the path bench. And she okay. was complaining about how her pants always got wet because they're growing out from under the bench. So I handed her the big giant, you know, loppers and said, have at it, you know. <laughs> and there's a blower in the green and in the, a rake and a blower, whichever way you want to, after you chop them off, what, what you want to rake it up with. And, and she did, man. She did a good job too. I'm keeping, you know, she can't go. Back I really to enjoyed your present. Really enjoyed your presentation. I could understand what you were saying. Sometimes with these Zoom meetings, I can't always understand what people are saying. But you were great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. 
Well, y'all going to go ahead and have your meeting now? And yeah. I'll, yes, I'll yes. We got one more, Russell. Oh. Um, yes, Dottie. Uh, my question is kind of for everybody. Does anybody just grind up eggshells to use for lime and calcium? Uh, I keep all my eggshells and grind them up into a powder and use that instead of having to buy lime. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. Okay, and another thing, uh, if you have a smaller greenhouse and you're familiar with aquarium pumps, uh, you can fill up five gallon buckets of water, put your fertilizer in there, put a hose on your pump, plug it in and you can water in your greenhouse fertilize using that method. If you don't yeah. want to get a, an expensive type of uh, fertilizer. That, um, that Siphon X I showed you is $15. Oh, okay. $15. That's if you have good water. I use rainwater. So it's, I use a, an aquarium pump to actually water and fertilize. Daddy, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I had a super um a couple of years ago and lost it through uh, crown rot. And I had it several years before I lost it. And it actually re for me and everything, so I was excited. But um, And I'd like to get another one. What do you recommend for those of us that are not who are not um, expert growers, what's a good beginning cypripedium or, or path for that reason? Or for that reason? You know, you're, uh, you must have a bad connection because I'm not quite getting it. But you're wanting to know what is a good beginner path to buy or Fragmapedia? Frag. Definitely not Balacha. <laughs> that's a little bit hard to grow because it, it's a very short stubby plant um i find them all easy to grow except that whole bolachum you know um all of those so i can't like recommend one but if you want um to go by the color claire de loom if you like that green and the stripe um and white green and white stripes on the petals i like that um Gosh, there's so many, you know, I love those big giant, um, like the Mercranthrum and the, um, I like Delanatii. It's a, it's, it's a little bit smaller than the palm of your hand, but it grows like a weed and you'll have five or six flowers at the same time. I like Delanatii. You're, you're going to have to go to one of the vendors and you're going to have to look and see. I see Jim Morrison has a path. <laughs> picture instead of his picture on his on his thing there so um it just depends um go with just like you pick out other orchids get them from a reliable source you know that they'll definitely have a good name on them it'll be disease and insect free and go with um what you like you know model foliage the dark green foliage the you want red ones you want yellow ones you want white ones you want the all the multicolored ones, you know, about that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Start with a healthy plant. Always, always, always start with a healthy plant. What do you do to get them to bloom? I have one a big eight inch pot and it doesn't bloom. Light is always the limiting factor. Light is always the limiting factor. So, you know, if the plant grows and grows and grows and doesn't bloom, you need to look at that light, you know, give it a little bit more light, not a lot, not a great, great transition, but you also need to look at that temperature in the fall. Are you letting that temperature drop about 10 degrees at night? Okay. You know, you want it, want it to get below 60. I let my set mine at 55 for about two weeks. So it's one or the other. Light is the most limiting factor. Mine is getting a lot of light uh, because it's actually outside right okay. now. I took it out this year. Outside. Okay, so I would look at that fall temperature then to make sure you're getting about two weeks of cold evening. Okay. 
I enjoyed the talk. Really, really enjoyed it. Okay. Well, I appreciate y'all inviting me. I hope you've all learned something that you can use. Definitely. And I'll see you next time. Thank you, Dottie. Thank you. Thank you. We can't you're hear you, Frank. Muted, Frank. Sorry about that. All right, there we go. Thank you all. Um, that since we decided to have the meeting by Zoom this time, we're a little disorganized compared to the in-person meeting that we were planning on. Um, but that's just as well because you know it, it's past eight now. Um, but Frank, did you have anything that you wanted to mention about the conservatory or are there other issues that um, people want to bring up before we let people go? Uh, I'm going to start roping people in to start helping out. I know August is a horribly hot month, but uh, uh, it would be, uh, we're, we're going to need some, uh, some people just to help out, especially if we have a short course and people are going to come in to uh, in December to uh, uh, you know to look at our meeting and see what we're doing. I just want to make sure everything looks good. So uh, expect a call from me, in, including the uh, president. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Okay. Um, well, unless anybody has something else they want to talk about, um, I guess we we'll, we can wrap it up. Okay. Thanks for putting this together. Thanks, y'all. No, I'm sorry for being late this evening, uh, but I really, I really enjoyed that. Um, I, I'm sure we'll follow up individually with some some members, um, whoever wants to discuss it. But I, I thought that was really a great. Yeah, I, think, presentation. I think we should. I think everyone should try to grow these. They're, I think they're. Uh, I think they're at home a lot easier than uh, than people make out. So. Yeah. Yeah, I've only got one um, path and. Um, I, I, I realize I probably should water it more. So, okay, everybody. Well, thanks, y'all. Thanks. Bye. Bye Happy August. <laughs>